So the panels on the roof are going to come into the charge controller. Give a big spark, black into my terminal. That's what I love about van life so much is that you make it yours. Hi guys, today I'm going to take you through my process of installing a from scratch battery and solar system. One of my previous videos was about cheap and easy battery power and this is neither of those. And I don't know if you can tell, but it just started raining. I might have to go inside the van here in a second. So let's talk about why I decided to go this route when there are so many easier options out there. I decided I wanted to phase out lithium ion as much as possible from my van. Lithium ion batteries can catch on fire when they get hot. My van gets really hot when it's parked at home and I wanna go on some backpacking trips. So I don't wanna to have to worry about the heat in the van as it's parked at the trailhead. That's why I decided to go with these red ODO batteries. They're lithium iron phosphate and they won't catch on fire, even in pretty extreme heat. So that means I can leave them installed in my van when I'm home. Speaking of installing them in the van, I want to design a system where everything is out of the way where I don't see the batteries, I don't have to move them around, and the plugs are all in convenient places. I don't wanna to have to charge the batteries before I leave for a trip either. So that leads to the next requirement, permanently mounted solar panels. By having the batteries charging all the time, they're totally ready to go when I am. I don't even have to think about loading them into the van, charging them, anything. When I'm camping in a city, I can't really set out my portable panels and I'm not much of an early riser, so now I don't have to get up early to position the panels to get the very first sunlight. As soon as the sun is up, wherever I am, they're working. As long as I'm not parked in total shade. <laughs> and the biggest reason I decided to do this was from my recent trip to Idaho. I went to Idaho for two weeks and it stormed almost every day, which meant that it was really cloudy and I couldn't get much solar power to my batteries. I was trying to work while I was there too, so I was running my Starlink and charging my computer. Every day I had to have a little internet plan. Okay, I'm gonna turn on the internet and I need to do this, this, this before I run out of power. So it was really stressful and I don't wanna have that problem again. So that's why I'm installing a huge battery bank. I'm putting two of these 200 amp red ODO lithium iron phosphate batteries in the back of the van. Each one is 2,560 watt hours. So in total, I'll have 5,200 watt hours, which sounds insane for a minivan, but I figure 40 watts for Starlink, 40 watts for my computer, and 40 watts for my freezer. That's 120 watts. If I wanted to run these three things constantly, these batteries will power them for almost 48 hours with absolutely no solar input. It would be a rare circumstance when I would need to run Starlink and my computer constantly like that, but it does happen, like when I'm downloading an update or trying to upload a long video or something. So like most of you, I'm a little intimidated by the thought of installing my own system, but I found some things that make it a lot easier and I'll explain everything as I go. So hopefully you can come away from this video with the confidence that you can do this too, if you think it's right for you. So first the warnings, why am I intimidated? Well, here's how you can mess up. Probably the biggest error is using wires that are too thin around. If your wires are too thin, they can overheat. I'm going to show you exactly what size wires I'm using and how to determine what size you should use. You also need to use fuses. Fuses are the gatekeepers at the wires that make sure too much power doesn't go through and cause overheating. This was probably what intimidated me the most. I didn't know anything about fuses. And you don't wanna to touch anything metal, like a wrench, to both of the terminals of the battery at the same time. So these are the biggie things that you need to keep in mind. But really, it's not that hard to install a system that will keep you powered for days. But really, it's not that hard to install a system that will keep you powered for days. Okay, let's start with the batteries. 
Like I said, these are 200 amp hour batteries from Red Odeo. The Plus version has an upgraded battery management system that allows more power to be used, like if you'll be using power tools. The dimensions are 20.5 inches long by about eight and a half inches high and 9.3 inches wide. They weigh about 50 pounds each, but they have these nice little uh, carrying straps that makes them a little easier to maneuver. You also can discharge them to 100%, so you don't have to worry about not draining them all the way. They'll last a really long time, they say 10 years of service life before they're degraded to 95%. How many charge cycles you can get does depend on how low you drain them. They'll last longer if you don't drain them all the way to zero. This is another benefit to having such a big power supply is I'll probably usually only drain them a tiny bit before the solar charges them back up. If you only charge them to 60%, they'll recharge 15,000 times. <laughs> so if you lower the batteries down every night and charge them back up in the morning, 15,000 charges is about 41 years. This is way more than a traditional lead acid battery, more than a lithium ion battery, and it's more than most of the other lithium iron phosphate batteries out there. So you're gonna be changing your vehicle before you're gonna need new batteries. You can get multiple batteries, or you can just get one. Red Odeo makes 50 amp batteries, all the way up to 410 amp hour batteries. I'll be hooking my batteries up in parallel, which means the voltage coming out will still be 12 volts. This is the simplest way to hook up your system. The user manual that came with these batteries is really impressive. It made me feel so much better about installing everything. It provides color diagrams, everything is grammatically correct, and all throughout the manual it says, if you have any questions, just call us. Also, after I bought the batteries, I got an invitation to join their Facebook group where you can see what other people are doing and what questions they have. The group is called Red Odeo Lithium Club. So I'm going to lay everything out here on the floor first so you can see what all the parts look like and how they connect. I think it's always hard to see exactly what's going on when people show you the components already installed in their vans. So if you want to duplicate this system exactly, I'll show you everything I bought and how much it cost. So the first thing I need to do is charge up the batteries fully before I can connect them together. So how do you charge them before you have everything connected? Well, you need a battery charger. This plugs into the wall. This is also a great backup power source. If it's been raining for a week or two, you can charge the batteries up at a campsite or any other place you can plug in. The batteries come with these bolts and washers. You wanna fully screw them in because if they're loose, that can cause overheating. Once they're done charging, you can measure the batteries to see if they're at the same voltage. It's not required, but it's not a bad idea to have a voltmeter. You can measure the batteries to see if they're at the same voltage. You can also measure your solar panels with this too, just in case anything stops working. This is a great diagnostic tool. So now that they're charged up, I'm going to connect them together so they can totally equalize. The manual says they need to be connected for 12 to 24 hours before using. I'm going to connect a wire from the positive, or the red terminal, to the other positive, and the negative, that's the black, to the other negative. Red Odeo recommends six gauge wire for this. The symbol for gauge is AWG, so you need six AWG wire. And just so you know, the lower the number, the thicker the wire. Some things that affect what size of wire you need are how much power is going through, as well as the temperature and the length of the wire. Since my van will be in hot conditions, I decided to go one size bigger, so I'm using size 4 gauge wire, or 4 AWG. Okay, so now that the batteries are equalized, I'll show you how everything goes together. One week later. Okay, so the devil's in the details, right? If you're going to be following along at home, here are some things to keep in mind. It's really important to use the right tools. If you don't know how to splice wires and crimp connectors, I recommend watching some videos to learn more about that. If you don't know much about electricity, watch some videos about how wires work. 
like you should know that electricity can flow both ways in a wire and the black and red coverings are just the color of the rubber other than that they're the same inside you should know how to calculate amps and how to size wires correctly for small wires you can splice and crimp them yourself if you have the right tools you need a wire stripper and a crimping tool and I use this little kit of connectors with a uh, heat gun to shrink the wrapping for bigger wire for thicker wire you need a bigger crimper like this guy so this is obviously big expensive and I found out I don't have the muscles to use it <laughs> so I recommend buying large gauge wire with the terminals already installed it'll be much easier trust me and when you buy wire make sure you don't get cca wire or copper coated aluminum this wire is a fire hazard you want either pure copper or tinned copper okay so let me show you uh how i have all my components hooked up i originally had my batteries hooked together in parallel to balance them out but I've removed those cables and I'm getting ready instead to hook them up to a bus bar. A bus bar is simply a bar with terminals, kind of like a USB hub. I don't want to connect the power up until I'm totally ready to go, but I'll have these four gauge wires coming off of both batteries into the bus bars. They also have some black boxes, which are circuit breakers, which I'll talk about those in a minute. So the power will go to the bus bars and the batteries will balance themselves out through the bus bars. Then my AC power will go from the bus bars to the inverter. And my DC power will come out of the bus bars and go to my DC fuse box. So this is what I'm using for my fuse box. This is where all of my uh, DC loads will come out of. So like my USB hub, my cigarette lighter, things like that. And the good thing about this is everything is connected with an Anderson connector. So it's really easy to remove um, things if I want to work on something or change one of the outlets out. And it also has fuses for each output. However, I don't know that I would actually recommend this. They were a little bit of a pain to install the connectors on. And I can't add anything later without putting on an Anderson connector. But on the other hand, if I want to work on something, I can easily unplug it. So there's pros and cons. My power will go into my fuse box and then out to my USB and cigarette lighter outlets. Instead, I would recommend you go with something more like this. It's a lot cheaper and easier to hook up. You just take the wires and you can directly hook the wires to the screws, or it'd be better to put a, a little, um, terminal or lug on the wire. But this is essentially the same thing. The power goes into the fuse box and then it comes out in various ways with fuses protecting each of those wires. So I realized I can't uh, run these to my block right away because I need to make sure they have enough wire. So I'm planning out where I'm going to put them. This has a great little mounting thing on it too so that'll be super easy to mount so I'll put that one there then on this side this is where I usually use my computer so I want my charge port for my computer to be over here and this one looks like this so I experimented you know how can I have it but I think the best thing it's just going to be in this little corner here. It'll fit right there. I can run the cable up under and to the back. And so then I'll have my uh, power delivery port for my computer right there. This is where I usually, I have my diesel heater cord coming out in the winter. Um, if I have my freezer, I usually have it over on this side. So I'm going to have this little guy over here. And I was thinking about putting him on the floor, but I think what I'll do is I'm going to Velcro it right to the bottom of the seat. That way my seat can go forward and back just fine. 
and I don't sacrifice this uh, storage under the seats. This is some pretty good storage here, so I think I'll just Velcro that there. And it won't hit anything that's hanging off the back of the seats either, so that'll be good. And I'm going to do the same on the other side here. I've already got some Velcro on it. Uh, so that'll go on this side too. And that way if I have the cooler in my passenger seat, I can just route the cord back here and keep it up in the front. So cool, now I just have to measure out the cord and make sure everything is long enough to go to the uh, little power strip. Now for the solar panel, I have this panel back here just for illustration. I have my panels mounted on the van. So the panels on the roof are gonna come into the charge controller and they're gonna go into the outlets that say PV plus and PV negative. The outlet terminals that say battery are going to go to my bus bar. So power will be coming in from the charge controller into the bus bar, and then it will either go straight out to my load, or if there's extra or if I'm not using anything, it'll go into the batteries. The charge controller has outputs for the load, so you might be wondering why am I not just using that? Well, there's a couple reasons. One is that this controller only has a maximum of 20 amps out. It says it's a 40 amp controller, but that refers to how much power it can take in. So be aware of that. Also, I was having problems with it giving me a short circuit error when I plugged in my USB outlets. Some of my outlets have on off switches, and as soon as I turned them on, it would give me a short circuit error and it would turn everything off. It would do fine if I started everything up in the on position, but it was just really finicky. As soon as I changed the load, it would say short circuit. So I just decided to wire everything to the bus bars. Okay, now let's talk about the safety measures. So remember at the beginning when I said wire size and fuses are two of the three most important things to get right. So wire size. So I have to think about what's the maximum amount of amps that might be coming out of the battery. Well, the inverter could run up to a thousand watts. It could be more at startup, but that's a very short amount of time, so I'll just use a thousand for my calculations. And the batteries might be really dead, say 10.8 volts. To get the amps, you divide the watts by the volts and you get 93 amps. So this will use more amps the lower my batteries are and say not only am I maxing out my inverter, but I'm also maxing out my fuse box, which is going to be 30 amps. So that gives me 123 amps that could be coming out of my main battery wires. Now I have two wires coming off the battery, so that divides the load up into, say, 60 amps coming out of each cable. My size 4 wire can handle 60 amps, so that's fine. You can easily Google this online by just typing in um, maximum ampacity for 4 AWG wire or 4 gauge wire and you'll get a big table of uh, the amps for each wire. So my wire is sized correctly, but if there was a short circuit somewhere and something started pulling a ton of power out, I want to protect these wires. So I installed a 100 amp circuit breaker on each one. That's what these black boxes are here. So if there's ever more than 100 amps going through the wires, the circuit will trip. And I put a circuit breaker instead of a fuse. That way I can easily turn off the battery power if I need to just work on something. I just push this button on each of them and now the batteries are disconnected. So then for my inverter, I want to use the same calculations. It would be rare for my inverter to be using more than 120 amps. So if the inverter shorted out or something started pulling a ton of amps, I don't want this wire to overheat. It's four gauge as well. So I installed an ANL fuse that will blow if there are ever more than 120 amps going through this wire. 
also have fuses on my wires coming out of my charge controller. My panels are pretty small on the roof. There's only 200 watts, so the most they could produce is about 11 amps. But if something went haywire and there was a ton of power surging through these wires, well, they're only 10 gauge wire and they're only good for about 40 amps. So I put 30 amp fuses in the wires to protect them. My wire from the bus bar to the fuse box has a 30 amp fuse as it goes into the box and all of my outlets are fused at 10 amps. So all of my wires are sized correctly and they all have fuses to prevent too much current from flowing through them and potentially catching on fire. Okay, so now I have to mount everything up so things aren't sliding around. The third safety feature I said at the beginning is to never touch the positive and negative terminals together. It sounds ridiculously simple, but it's actually surprisingly easy how this could happen because it just happened to me. <laughs> and I got really lucky. I didn't uh, ruin my batteries, but I was unhooking the wires I had, uh, putting the batteries in parallel, and the negative end of the black wire accidentally touched the positive terminal. Gave a big spark, blackened my terminal, but they're both reading uh, the same voltage, so I think I got really lucky. But man, and that was after I even like thought about this video. So man, be really careful. It can happen. It just happened to me. So aside from human error, uh, I also don't want any of these components to slide around as I drive and accidentally touch the terminals. I also want to make sure I protect these terminals so, you know, if a spoon drops down inside and lands perfectly, it's not going to ruin my batteries. I also don't want this to take up my entire back storage, so I'm going to try and mount everything on top of the batteries. I was originally going to just Velcro everything on top, but look at this, say the Velcro came off in the heat and this inverter plate could totally slide up here and voila, the metal would touch both terminals. So I don't have much room, but I think I found something that will work. I'm gonna show you how I mount. One thing I considered doing was mounting my charge controller permanently to the bus bars as well. I could just take my clamps and cut off the wires and put that on the bus bar. Um, that'd be really convenient, but I don't think I'm gonna have enough room to mount everything the way I want to, um, kind of all in this area. So I don't think I'll mount this permanently, but it's an idea for you. Okay, so I think I have everything connected. Um, what I did was I used just a shelf board here and I glued on an extra piece of wood just to make sure that nothing would slide this way. And that allowed me to uh, put on this little piece of scrap. All this is scrap wood, so that's why the pieces are kind of weird. But um, I just put some Velcro on one end to just hold it in place. But now, I can cover my terminals and make sure that I don't do something stupid. Um, so I have my inverter here. It comes around, here's that ANL fuse, comes up to the bus bar. Um, the black end comes over to the black bus bar. My fuse box to the bus bars and the charge controller to the bus bars. Um, I don't know, this is probably overkill, but I just Velcroed some pieces of wood here because these do have covers, but uh, you know, like you could still touch something there. So I put these pieces of wood, I originally had these straight, but I thought, well, you know, I could angle them just a little bit and get just a little bit more protection. It's kind of hard because these wires have to come out the sides, so you can't totally uh, just close them off. 
but um, I could also still put like a, a board over this and that would protect it a little bit more too. I'll have to see what it looks like once I'm in the van. So I think this will fit. The only thing I have left to do is install my battery cables. So this is that circuit breaker. And the cool thing is once I install this, my system still won't have power until I pop that in. If I want to turn it off, I just push that button. So that'll be nice. I can hook this up and everything still won't be live until I'm ready. And then, then the power goes through. And then I'll have to look at this and see um, where I can put it that'll be super safe too. So I did mount these with screws here. The charge controller, I ended up just putting some Velcro on. Um, I'm not gonna take it off now, but uh, it's got this piece of wood protecting it from sliding into the, the bus bar there. And the inverter is screwed down with one screw for now. So now I just have to uh, cross my fingers and hope that my original measurements were correct and that everything will actually fit underneath the bed. Cross your fingers for me. That wasn't super graceful, <laughs> but it's in. Okay, so now, so now I just have to be super careful of these terminals. Okay, time for battery number two. Okay, so now what? Okay, it's time to turn on the power. I do like these terminals because you don't need a wrench. All you need is a screwdriver. So the good thing about these circuit breakers is I can have them off so that even though these are connected, there's still no power in the system. My poor terminal that I scorched. Hopefully it works all right. Hmm, I might have to do this one inside. Good thing I have my little stubby screwdriver. It fits right underneath. Now I just need to see if I can get everything situated with my wood planks and my inverter fitting. Oh man, these were not tangled at all in the house. <laughs> How did they get so tangled up now? Oh, I might have to disconnect some cords. So now I just have to plug in my loads, my USB outlets, but I've got to figure out what to do about these circuit breaker um, terminals, how I can mount them and keep them from touching anything else. Okay, I'm gonna turn the power on. I've got everything wired. So I'm gonna flip one switch here. Which way? Okay, that way. And this switch here. Okay, I hope everything doesn't um, explode. Yeah, headlight! My charge controller is on. I don't have the panels hooked up yet. And I've got a green light on my fuse box. And my USB hub is on. And my power delivery hub is on. And my cigarette lighter in the front. And my cigarette lighter on the side. Yay! 
I have power. I don't smell smoke yet. <laughs> I'm officially done. Oh, it feels so good to be done. And it is so cool. I can't wait to show you. So this is the back of the van. I have my bed down because that way you can see things a little bit better. Um, and I have, this is my storage flap. So as you can see, there is no electrical. What? <laughs> so I put a little board here. Ta-da! So that just lifts out. And in the meantime, all of this gets to stay nice and protected. I tried Velcroing this terminal onto the battery here, but it's not staying very well. So I wanted to just totally block off all of this stuff from anything that I could potentially have in the back here. So it's all tucked away there. So then when I throw in my backpack and I throw in little things with straps or whatnot, nothing is going to touch any of the electrical. And this is my Starlink. Well, I'll show you that in a minute. Okay, so let's go inside the van. I can show you better from inside here. All right, let me show you from inside. You can see a little bit better from inside. So I had these holes cut out so I could access my storage, but it worked out perfectly that everything is accessible from uh, these little holes here. So let me show you what I've got in here. Okay, so I have my Renogy charge controller and I put a piece of wood here with some Velcro to block off my bus bars. It doesn't have to hold on a lot. It just has to block things from falling down and potentially getting in between the two and touching the metal. And I tell you, nothing is more guaranteed to fall down in there than when you're holding something going, now, whatever you do, do not drop this right there. <laughs> I dropped so much stuff. Uh, screwing in my wires. I dropped my screwdriver. I dropped screws. I dropped screwdriver tips. Oh my gosh. So that's one of the reasons why I was like, I need to cover these. In everyday usage, it's probably never going to be in danger. But man, when you're installing all this stuff and moving stuff around in this small space, I am really glad I have this on there. So my bus bars are completely um, protected. And then after my bus bars, you can see my DC fuse box. And I put some labels on the wires, USB hub. Then right about here is where I have the uh, piece of wood over the two battery terminals. And then over here is my inverter. And then I have a power strip that comes out of here. And I also have a remote uh, plug that came with it. So that runs up my thing here and here's the remote for the inverter and here's my power strip and this is Starlink plugged in so all I have to do to turn on the internet is just press this little button how awesome is that I have some wires kind of hidden up in the spare there and then on this side I also have my power delivery so this is where I'll plug my laptop into and on my other cabinet, I have my USB hub. And this is my little light bulb. So to turn it on, I just turn the hub on and the light bulb turns on. How cool is that? And I don't have any wires here. This was always like this big rat's nest of wires. So I have some wires coming down here that are hidden in the trim. And that is for my Wii Boost, and the other is for this light. And so the Wii Boost comes down, and it's right there. Its power goes through the floor and gets plugged in at this outlet here. I was able to hide a lot of cords just by pushing them under the trim here. So that's pretty cool. This was always like a big rat's nest of cords. So I'm so happy that everything's all put away. So here in this outlet, I just have it Velcroed to the bottom of the seat here. And I have uh, the Wii Boost, and this is my fridge that is in the front seat. And it's been running uh, for about 24 hours. 
And my last outlet is this little outlet down here. Same thing, two cigarette lighter plugs, but it will be where I plug my diesel heater into because it plugs into a cigarette lighter that comes in through the window here. So I've been testing it and I've been running Starlink and my freezer for almost 24 hours straight. Um, and the skies have been a little overcast and my batteries are still at like 90%. So they ran the inverter and they ran the freezer all night long, um, probably about maybe 80 watts, probably more like uh, 70, 60 watts, something like that, all night long, no sun. And it's been cloudy, overcast all day today, and I still have plenty of battery left. This is so exciting. And I'm so excited that everything is put away. I don't have cables hanging over. I can have everything tacked away. I was never able to do that before because I never had a permanent spot for my batteries. I always needed to move them or I was always kind of moving things around and pulling them out to charge. But this, I can really have everything permanently mounted, which is really cool. So how difficult was it? Um, it was pretty difficult, but mostly because I didn't really know what I was doing. <laughs> I didn't do as much research as I should have, which led to me buying stuff and having it not fit on the terminals or having it not be thick enough or it was a lot of um, learning as I went. <laughs> but now I really understand how the system works. And if anything goes wrong, I totally know where to look. I know how all the fuses work. Um, so I'm really happy about that. But I've got this like kind of intimidating looking system in here, but I know exactly how it works. I hooked up the whole thing, which I feel really good about. Uh, there were times when I was like, this is not worth it. <laughs> I should just get a power station? Why am I doing all this work? But now that it's done and it's charging from the solar all the time, I can go run errands, I can do whatever I want, and it's charging the whole time. I can leave everything on. I never have to worry about the batteries not being charged when I go on a trip. Uh, this is super cool. I think it's totally worth it now that I've done it. <laughs> but it's definitely not for everybody, and most people do not need this much battery power. If you don't need this much battery power, get a power station. Like, it'll be fine. But for what I needed it for, and for the places I go, and the way I need to have power all the time, stuff like that, um, this is really what fits my needs. And that's what van life is all about. That's what I love about van life so much is that you make it yours. Whatever you need it to be, you can make it be that. You don't have to make cookie cutter solutions work. You can have exactly what you need. So that's why a lot of people say, uh, you know, try it out for a while before you decide on something because you probably don't know what you need. You know, if you haven't done this a lot, you're gonna get in here and change things around 50 times before you find out what you actually want. So take your time with that, find out what you need, and then try to build it. Because it's so awesome when it fits your needs exactly. So I hope you enjoyed this. I'm going to put a picture of my setup and links of what everything is and where to buy it if you wanna copy my system exactly. And next week, I'm going to show you how I mounted the solar panels to my roof. And uh, let me know what you think about my system. I have one more update I need to do. I have to install a battery monitor because I don't really know how much power is coming out of my batteries. So I need to do some research on that. <laughs> and um, I'll make a video about updating that. And yeah, let me know what questions you have and I'll help you out if I can. And in the meantime, make it yours. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for watching. See you later.